to start out with a thank you. Thank you for getting here on time today. Oh my gosh, you guys were amazing. And I can only say that because they've taken off already. So, but thank you. It just made me feel so proud. All right, have you ever heard of the Conscience Fund? This is one of three funds that was set up by the United States Treasury for people to voluntarily give to it for money they have defrauded or stolen from the government. You ever heard of that? It was first set up in 1811, and in that very first year, there was $5 that was given to this fund. But over the next 175 years, there's been over 5.7 million that people have given because they have guilty consciences and they've given to this fund. Now, they've had all kinds of of different types of giving. There was once a nine cents was given because somebody had reused a postage stamp. I know, crazy. And there was one person who gave over many years $40,000 because they had defrauded the government of 8000 It happens in so many different ways. Usually people do it very anonymously, but often it's pastors who hear a deathbed confession and then they turn the money over because of what they've heard. But not everybody's fully repentant. Let's be honest here. Not everybody has the fullest of intentions when they, when they do this. In fact, I want to read a little note that they received once. It says, Dear Internal Revenue Service, I have not been able to sleep at night because I cheated on last year's income tax. In close, find a cashier check for $1,000. If I still can't sleep, I'll send you the balance. So today we're going to talk about the realities of human beings, and, and that is that we often carry shame and regret. That's kind of a part of being human. We all suffer with shame and regret, and we deal with it in different ways, but it's pretty universal that at some point you're going to feel those feelings. And we're continuing our, our sermon series on just very basic United Methodist theology, because we believe in order to really have a life of faith and to know our true identity, you have to have some understanding of theology. You have to know what you actually believe in order to have a clear identity as a follower of Jesus Christ. And theology, believe it or not, can help you deal with things like regret and shame. There's, a, there's an answer for it here. And so today we're going to focus on original sin and forgiveness and we're going to teach you what United Methodists believe, but first we're going to start out in, in Scripture, and we're going to read to you out of Romans 3, verses 21 through 26. So let's hear the Word of God. But now God's righteousness has been revealed apart from the law, which is confirmed by the law and the prophets. God's righteousness comes through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ for all who have faith in him. There's no distinction. All have sinned and fall short of God's glory. But all are treated as righteous freely by his grace because of a ransom that was paid by, Jesus, by Christ Jesus. Through his faithfulness, God displayed Jesus as a place of sacrifice where mercy is founded by a means of his blood. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness in passing over sins that happened before, during the time of God's patient tolerance. He also did this to demonstrate that he is righteous in the present time and to treat the one who has faith in Jesus as righteous. Sometimes Romans is a little hard to understand, but what I need to tell you is that this is such a beautiful passage. It is the very heart of Romans. It kind of sums up Romans right here. This is the very most important thing you need to hear in the book of Romans, and that is that we find salvation by faith alone. Now, that is amazing, but maybe you haven't really thought it yet through. It means you are no longer tied, but rather you're freed from the principle of performance. You no longer have to perform for God. You no longer have to, to wonder if you're worthy enough. You no longer have to, to try to be a good Christian like the guy next to you and, and, and feel like you're constantly failing. You no longer have to worry if you and God are okay. He is literally offering you his salvation freely. 
because he looks at you and he loves you and he, and, and he is, knows you and he understands you. And it's just simply free. You don't have to prove anything to him, which is so different in the world where we live where we're constantly proving ourselves, trying to make ourselves worthy. And so this is where we're going to look today. We're going to focus on today. We simply have to believe in him. We have to decide to put our faith in him. And we need to finally admit to him that we need him. But if we're willing to do that, it is freely offered to us. So this is our segue into our first theological teaching today. And that is on original sin. And some of you maybe never heard of this before. Um, it's not too hard to figure out, but I just listened to the name of it. But we're going to take the understanding of our book of discipline. So over the last couple of weeks we've been teaching you, we actually as Methodists have a book of discipline. The book of discipline is sort of like our constitution. It is grounded in, in scripture, and then it's been formed through the notes and the sermons of John Wesley, who is the founder of the Methodist movement back in the 1700s. So when we read some of these articles of our faith, they're going to sound very old-fashioned. The language is very old-fashioned, but it's important what is said, and it's still very true. So I want to read to you Article 7 of Original or Birth Sin. Original sin standeth not in the following of Adam, but it is the corruption of the nature of every man that naturally is engendered of the offspring of Adam, whereby man is very far gone from original righteousness, and of his own nature inclined to evil, and that continually. Okay, let's unpack that a little bit. What this means is every human being, the entire human race, needs forgiveness. Because every one of us is broken. Every one of us is failed. Every one of us has a need for God because none of us are perfect. As a human race, we are so imperfect. And a lot of people say that goes back to Genesis 3 where remember the story of creation. We have Adam and Eve in the garden and they make all these bad decisions. And we can kind of relate to them because we're like, my life's full of bad decisions. We understand that we have this tendency as a human race to do the wrong thing. And I don't think that surprises anybody here. I mean, think about it. Don't we all think human beings, man, they're mean. They make bad decisions. They're greedy. They don't do the right thing. They don't treat each other right. We're pretty aware of the need of humankind for salvation because we see it all around us. And that is part of an understanding of original sin. We are all born with this need for salvation. But it's also about your individual sin. You also have to be aware of your personal need. Because let's face it, there's other people who are much worse than you. But the reality is we all have a need personally. We all have a need for God's saving, for God's grace in our lives. None of us are exempt, and we have to be aware of it. The, the key is you can't expect God to forgive you if you don't even know you're broken. If you don't admit to him that you have a need for him, that you have a need to change in your life, then you can't really receive his grace. And so you have to be self-aware. This reminds me of an old um, story I used to hear. I used to be a, a, a big follower of Garrison Keillor, and I used to weekly listen to Prairie Home Companions. Is there anybody here old enough to remember that? Okay, so for those of you who've never heard of it before, it was a radio show that was on weekly, and it was a storyteller, and the storyteller, Garrison, would talk about a small town, a fictional town called Lake Wobegon. It was a small town where everybody knew each other, and everybody went to church, and he talked about all the Lutherans that would go there. And he'd tell these stories about them. And they were very relatable because we're all human and we understand small communities. And so he tells a story about a man named Larry. Well, he said, Larry was saved 12 times at a Lutheran church that never had an altar call. Larry, between 1953 and 1961, Larry Sorensen would come down two, 12 different times to the altar, weeping buckets, falling apart at the communion rail, devastated by his need for God. 
And the pastor, who baby had really preached just a dry sermon that day on stewardship, would come forward and kneel with Larry and wrap his arms around Larry and pray for him and made sure that he could get home that day. And this is what Garrison Keillor said about Larry. Even we fundamentalists got tired of him. Keillor writes, God didn't mean for you to feel guilty all your life. There comes a time when you should dry your tears and join the building committee and grapple with the problems of the church furnace and the church roof. But Larry just kept repenting and repenting. So that leads us into our second theological truth. What do we need to know about repentance? So I'm going to go back and we're going to read um, out of our book of discipline. This is actually Article 12. It's of, called Of Sin After Justification. Not every sin willingly committed after justification is the sin against the Holy Ghost and unpardonable. Wherefore, the grant of repentance is, is not to be denied to such as fall into sin after justification. After we've received the Holy Ghost, we may depart from grace and given and fall into sin, and by the grace of God, rise again and amend our ways. Therefore, we are to be... Therefore, they are to be condemned who say they can no more sin as long as they live here or deny the place of forgiveness to such as truly repent. That's even more confusing. So let me unpack this because the truth in here is pretty amazing. The truth is, first, let's say it's about justification. So that's another United Methodist word. Justification is about that moment or that season or that journey when you suddenly, or maybe over a long period of time, decide to turn your life over to God. You kind of just, somewhere along the line, you're, you've decided, my way's not working, and I'm going to commit myself to God. I'm going I'm to give over my will to him, and I'm going to let him be the boss. I tried being the boss, and it didn't work, but now I'm going to let him be the boss. And when we do that, this justification, we receive forgiveness of sin. Everything we've ever done is gone. I mean, we don't have to carry regret and shame anymore because anything we ever did before that moment has been forgiven and in God's mind forgotten. It's like we never did it. And, and that's like amazing that we can be forgiven of some things that just have hurt so many people. We're just forgiven. We're not like Larry. Larry who keeps thinking he's losing his faith. You don't lose your faith. But you do need to continue repenting. There's a difference. And that part of the truth of, of, of this theology on forgiveness, repenting, asking God to forgive us, should be continual throughout our lifetimes. We should never stop repenting because, let's be pretty honest, most of us have a continual need to repent. We're broken. We, we continue to make mistakes. And so we are invited to continue. It should be as often as we pray that we admit, God, I did it again. God, I'm in need of you. I'm still in need of you. And that's this amazing gift that that talks about that is given to us, this continual ability to maintain our relationship is to confess our sins before him. What a gift of love is that to us. But we need to be really careful we need to never think that the grace of God is some, like some inexhaustible bank that every time I can mess up, and I'm not going to worry about messing up because I can just head to the bank again and take out some more grace. It's not supposed to be that way. You are receiving forgiveness so that you can be a different human being, so that you don't have to fall into the same traps over and over again. You can become better. And that's what forgiveness should do. It should be setting you on a path to go in the right direction, not just keep repeating the same error. Now, let's be honest. Some things are going to be take a lot more work. There's so much more part of us, and, and maybe we were raised that way, and it's going to take a lot of extra effort. But the reality is if we confess our sin, we're saying we're going to walk in a different direction. We're going to try to not repeat that. The reason we do that is because we don't want to cheapen grace. This gift that's offered to us, we don't want to treat it like it doesn't matter. The theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer said it this way, cheap grace, is cheaping of, cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. 
baptism without church discipline, communion without confession, absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. We never want to cheapen it. This takes us back to Romans 3 again, right? This grace is offered to us because we have original sin. And it's offered freely. We don't have to earn it. We don't have to be a super Christian. We have to just humbly admit we got a problem. We can't do it on our own. And then when we are in relationship with him, we can keep going back to him. Not thinking that we have lost our religion like Larry, but to think in terms to maintain our faith. We keep repenting of our sins, believing that we eventually will be transformed. And we won't gossip as much as we gossip. Or we will love people we didn't used to love. Or we will be changed in ways that is beautiful. That's what happens with this continual repentance, this gift that's offered to us. But here's the deal. A lot of times we think that's the end of the story. You know, man, I got to get good with God and then I'm fine. But that is so short-sighted because God wants so much more for us than that. God's got greater plans for us than just feeling like we're good with God. You see, we get good with God so that we can be good with the world. God gives us this grace and this forgiveness so that we can go out into the world and give grace and forgiveness. You see, God understood how hard it was going to be to live in this world, and it is hard. And he understood that we were going to get hurt a lot. People were going to disappoint us. People are going to devastate us. People are going to do the wrong thing to us, and we're going to have to learn to forgive. And that is what forgiveness is. We receive forgiveness so we can forgive. That's the end goal. We receive the love of God so that we can love. That's what we're called to. That's what we're all aiming for. And learning to forgive is the greatest thing in the whole world. Because I'm telling you right now, there is nothing worse than being in a place of bitterness or a lack of forgiveness. I mean it. It plagues you. It's in your head all the time. Every time something is mentioned, it will rile up and all the emotions in you will be riled up again and you'll be angry all over again. A lack of forgiveness takes you hostage and holds you and it's horrible. And you want to be free of it. And you can't because you're just so angry or just so hurt. But here is the most amazing news. Because we're a people that are forgiven, we can move into forgiveness we can be freed of that. That's why God gave it to us. He knew how hard the world would be. He knew we would need his help. I want to share a story with you because it was the greatest moment in my life. Oh, my gosh, when I really experienced forgiveness. I think I've shared it before, but it's worth repeating. It was very momentous in my life. So I was in my mid-30s. I was single, and I had a really dear friend. And I was starting a relationship with somebody I thought had great potential. We were just at the beginning of it, but I was, I was investing. And unbeknownst to me, I had gone away for a couple weeks, and unbeknownst to me, the two of them began a relationship. And I didn't see it coming. I was so blindsided by it, and I was so hurt and I was so angry, and I was so embarrassed. Oh, my gosh. I, this just knocked me over. I never saw it coming. I was mad at God. I was like, God, why didn't you warn me they were doing something behind my back? Why didn't I see this? A little preparation would have helped, and I just was co so caught off guard, and I was so betrayed by my friend. I just, it just overwhelmed me. And this wasn't a person that I would just see once in a while. I saw her every single day. And I had to watch her over the next several months fall in love with this person, and they, they got engaged eventually. And every day, I observed them. Man, it was like walking in a fog every day. It really was horrible. I, I'll say it was horrible. And I was a mature enough Christian to know that I couldn't carry that continually. I had to go to God. 
And I would like to say I asked God to forgive me and help me forgive her, but it just didn't happen that way. I mean, I had to go to God over and over and over and cry and beg and ask him to help me forgive this person. I was just devastated. And for months, I walked in that fog. And then, I think it would have been about six months. And this is short when it comes to forgiveness, because sometimes forgiveness takes a lot longer than six months. But about after about six months one day, it was miraculous. It was like the fog left. And suddenly, not only did I totally forgive her, totally love her again, I was so relieved that I didn't get in a relationship with the person she was engaged to. I felt such a relief that I had been spared of him. And it was amazing. I was so happy, and I have never felt so free in my life. I wanted to hug them and thank them. I couldn't do that. That wouldn't have been appropriate. But I wanted to think, oh, my goodness, I've been saved from anger and bitterness, and I've been saved from a bad relationship. And here's the thing. You know, you can't outdo God. You just can't outdo God. About six months after that, I met this guy, and my life was changed. He was the right person for me. And I knew God once again had overwhelmed me with his love and goodness. That's the gift that God has given us. That's when it says to us, we're justified by faith. We're like, yeah, no, it's huge. Because of the justification by faith, because we just simply have to believe, it will permeate so many parts of your life. And you will know that you can release your guilt. You'll know you can release your shame. And you will know that you can forgive someday. It may take some effort. It may take a lot of prayer. But there will be a day when you will be freed of the pain of hurt. You see, it always comes down to love. That's what God is calling to us. He's calling us to a place of love. Everything is God's love. God's love is always the goal. I like the what Thomas Merton sums it up this way. Our job is to love others without stopping to inquire or not whether they're worthy. That's not our business. In fact, it's nobody's business. We are asked to, what we're asked to do is love. And this love will itself render both ourselves and our neighbor worthy. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.